Welcome to Daisy Miller Part 2. I had a professor in college that used to say there are two types of people in this world, those that love Henry James and those who don't. And I think what he meant by this is that some people really like the way that Henry James writes with all the de detail and kind of the gossipy way almost that he tells about people in his own society. And some people have a harder time getting into it. He's a very good example of realism because he portrays people so realistically. In any case, I hope you are enjoying it, but if you're not, I'm going to do my best to kind of walk through the main key events in part two so that you can follow them. I'd like to start out by reminding you of the main characters in Daisy Miller that we've encountered so far. The first one is Frederick Winterborn. He's our main character. And we talked last time about how it's in first person limited, but we get most of the story through Frederick's eyes. And I think through his viewpoint, we see that he considers people very carefully. He cares a lot about society, what society thinks, and he cares a lot about living up to expectations. Um, but he also kind of wonders about things. And there's, he has all these tensions within himself as he approaches the world. And the main reason for all these tensions in this short story is Daisy Miller herself. She's this beautiful, young, very free American woman that he's obsessed with, and she does not really conform to social conventions. The other flat characters, um, who are not as complex, not as nuanced, we only get snapshot pictures of them, are Mrs. Costello, that's Winterborn's aunt. She cares a lot about what society thinks. We have this kind of very straightforward interpretation of her. She refuses to know Daisy Miller or to meet her. We also have Mrs. Miller, who's Daisy's mother. She's a very hands-off mother. She doesn't really care what Daisy does. Um, and she certainly doesn't look after her the way that most mothers would in European society. We have Randolph, who's her younger brother. He always wants candy, kind of says what he's thinking. Mrs. Walker comes in part two. She's a good friend of Winterborn's. Daisy tries to befriend her. She cares a lot about Daisy's reputation. And she throws a party and eventually snubs Daisy. And our last character is Mr. Giovanelli. It calls him the little Italian throughout the text, but he's the Italian man that Daisy goes around with in Rome. A lot of people wonder if she's engaged with him to him because she spends so much time with him. So here are the main characters you need to know. Now if we move into part two and kind of talk about the overall plot and what happens, we learn at the beginning of part two that they've gone to Rome. So we still have these Americans that are living overseas. They're spending a lot of time in Rome. It's still the 1880s. Only a few months have passed. And then the main source of tension is the way that Daisy Miller acts in Rome and the different ways in which she kind of violates the norms of society. And Mrs. Walker, this good friend of Winterborn's, explains it most clearly when she says the line, everything that is not done here. So if you do a control F search and search for everything that is not done here, we can see kind of this list of things that she's doing in Italy. Flirting with any man she could pick up, sitting in corners with mysterious Italians, dancing all evening with the same partners, receiving visits at 11 o'clock at night, and her mother going away. So she's doing all these things that kind of violate the standards of society as a single woman, what she should be doing. And Winterborn says she seems to be very uncultivated below. He hasn't really made up his mind entirely. Um, he wants to give her the benefit of the doubt because he really likes her. And he even tells her this directly. He tells her her habits are something of a flirt later on. I'm afraid your habits are those of a flirt, said Winterborn gravely. And then her response is very interesting. Of course they are, she cried, giving him her little smiling stare again. I'm a fearful, frightful flirt. Did you ever hear of a nice girl that was not? But I suppose you will now tell me I'm not a nice girl. So she, she's well aware that she's flirting, but it just doesn't bother her. Um, she does all these things that are outside of society. But she doesn't, I mean, she doesn't want to be rejected by society, but it's not the way that she's going to make all of her decisions. It's not how she wants to live her entire life. But in any case, he tells her that society has a very low opinion of her. Mrs. Walker goes out in the carriage to try to save her when she's going off with Giovanelli by herself. 
She refuses to get in the carriage. And then everything kind of comes to a head when Mrs. Walker snubs her at the party. She turns her back on her, won't talk to her. And that's when um, Winterbourne really realizes that things are different. The plot ends very suddenly when Daisy Miller catches malaria. She goes out at night, she goes to the Coliseum, she catches what's called the Roman fever throughout, and it is malaria, it's passed through mosquitoes, so they're out late at night, and she doesn't listen to what society is saying, so she goes out alone with Giovanelli, she catches the fever, and she dies within a few weeks. But after she dies, this is where we really get kind of the moral lesson of the story. So I'm looking at the passage, this is near the end, Giovanelli and, and Winterborn are standing by her grave. He doesn't wear his buttonhole. And then he says, I'm looking right here, she was the most beautiful young lady I ever saw and the most amiable or the most friendly. And then he added in a moment, and she was the most innocent. So Winterborn can't quite believe that he says this. He asks him why he took her to that place. He says she wanted to go. He didn't have a fear for himself. And then he explains, Giovanelli does, that she would never have married him. And this is when Winterborn kind of has this realization. He realizes that Daisy Miller really was an innocent person. She wasn't doing anything that was really wrong. It just didn't fit in with what society said. So in some sense, she was being a true American and just doing, you know, her own thing. And he realizes that he's been gone for too long. We see this in the very end of the story when he's talking to his aunt. He says, you were right in that remark that you made last summer. I was booked to make a mistake. I have lived too long in foreign parts. And then we get the end where he kind of goes off with his life anyway. But we see that he misjudges Daisy Miller. Um, he turns her into sort of this flirty person who's willingly going beyond the bounds of society when really she's just having a good, innocent time. And I do want to talk a little bit about the symbolism of their names and how that kind of works. If we look back at our literary terms for the course, we have a symbol. It's here at the end. Something that, although of interest in its own right, stands for or suggests something larger and more complex. And I submit to you that both Daisy's name and Winterborn's name are highly symbolic for how we can think of them as characters. Daisy's name, and here I have some daisy flowers put up, are these really fragile, beautiful, and innocent looking flowers. They remind us sort of of the country. They're not really cultivated, but they're beautiful and innocent nonetheless. So her name kind of shows this American innocence and this beauty that Daisy has. And then Winterborn's name, I've got just a picture of Winter here, shows kind of his cold outlook and this way of looking at her and judging her in a way that isn't entirely fair. He's very cold in the way that he treats her. So here we have kind of symbols of their names and what they might mean. Those are the most important parts in part two.